<laughs> you girls ready to hit the road? Yep. Shall I start? I don't see the record button or anything on yet. It says well, good morning. Not... Welcome to the Intertribal Agriculture Council 2020 virtual conference. Normally we're in Las Vegas this week, but due to COVID, we're broadcasting live from all parts of the United States. Today is the second day of the economics tract. This morning we will be um, viewing the economic benefits of livestock handling with Kurt Pate via Kelsey Ducheneau. Um, we'd also like to give a big thanks to the sponsor of the IEC conference. This session is sponsored by our Champions of Native Agriculture. So without any further ado, Kelsey. Thank you very much for that introduction. It is an honor to be able to be here today um, talking and showing some of the work of one of my good friends, Kurt Pate. Um, Kurt and I met as a result of me being probably a uh, almost borderline annoying uh, master's student um, who was looking for a real hands-on um, stockmanship based internship to finish out my master's degree with Colorado State University. Uh, we were able to rope Kurt into coming out here onto the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation in uh, late 2016 and to do a stockmanship demonstration on our ranch here on the DX Ranch for the local Cheyenne River Youth Horsemanship Group. He's an outstanding individual and he really sees uh, the world like I think livestock do. Um, he's put a lot of, he's put his whole career into interpreting how livestock view the world and how we as stockmen can better position ourselves to contribute to using those stock as our um, land stewardship tool. On an article of www.agriculture.com's reaping the benefits of good stockmanship, Kurt shared a message that encouraged producers to implement good principles because they don't cost any money. Simply put, it just takes time, self-control, and a willingness to work hard. Kurt summed it up with a quote, good stockmanship can give you more pleasure and help you increase profit potential more than anything else I know. He reminds us that it can change your quality of life, and that is very powerful. So he, Kurt is actually unable to join us today, but he has shared a series of videos that he's um, helped to or been featured in and published on YouTube. Um, we're going to go ahead and cycle through these with a brief break in between to just really highlight some of the big picture ideas that Kurt wants to make sure within each video we relate back to the um, effective stockmanship and how that impacts a producer's bottom line. So without further ado, we're going to get started here with the 2020 BQA, BQA Educator Award video featuring Kurt Pate. I started out even as a child, a young guy, and both my grandfathers were cattlemen. One worked in big feedlot, and the other one's a kind of a cow trader and horse trader. And my dad was in the auction business, so I learned a lot of different aspects of the beef industry and the whole ranching industry. But I think I really got a nice start because of my grandfathers and their skills as stockmen. Stockmanship is all about animal care and husbandry. It can be learned and it can be approved on. I think people can be so much more effective when you care about everything, but you're still having fun. Stewardship is using a resource in a way that that resource stays as good or gets better through use. And that's what I think our real job is. Beef Quality Assurance started out with the need for injection sites, handling your vaccines properly, getting the right things in the right spots. But now I believe we've evolved into kind of a holistic Beef Quality Assurance program. And my little part is getting the animals ready for the science. I think it's great. I'm using an age old technology since biblical times. And now we're combining that along with modern technology and science and you can't have one without the other. So the stockmanship is so important for the science to take hold and work. 
I think maybe the industrial revolution took us away from stockmanship. We got so into machines and now the computer revolution or the technology. But when I look down the road and try to look five, 10, 15 years, I see these young ladies and gentlemen that are coming into our industry in dairies or feedlots or out on a ranch. And they know how important the stockmanship and the cattle handling and the whole beef quality assurance program, the whole package, how important it is to success and to our consumers that I think we have a rejuvenation of kind of an old standard of stock and ship. I can't wait to see what these folks come up with and how good they're going to be. When I think of how important this is, the Beef Quality Assurance Program, I'm so honored because it's come so far and now to be to the point where cattle handling is another part of it is just, it's incredible to me and I'm so proud to be a part of it. So, so proud to be on the list with the great people that have been pioneers in this industry. Talk about some views there. That's a lot better than my background here. Uh, so I, I really wanted to just appreciate and value that, that Kurt mentioned, you know, BQA and all of these standardized regulate, regulatory or um, optional certifications and, and things that you can build into your operation to kind of ensure and um, guarantee that quality, you know, those are only one side of the tools. Um, and we have to make sure that as we're um, building in BQA certification and ascribing to our own stockmanship practices, we, we have to kind of check ourselves, right? We can do the BQA certification, um, but especially in a year of COVID, there's not going to be as many on-site verifications. There's not going to be people coming out to your place, holding you to your standard. And it, it really almost is a, a self-reflection that we have to make as stockmen and as stewards to ensure that we're upholding ourselves to that standard and that precedent that we have committed to um, maintaining within our operations. Next, we're going to get into a little bit longer of a video um, that is titled Stockmanship with Kurt Pate. Um, this talks a lot about the, um, the human inclination and, and breaking bad habits or building better habits, so to speak. So we're going to jump into this video and then we will go ahead and recap on a few pieces at the end. For 15 years, the, the iPad, the computers, the cell phones, they've become really, really important to our lives. They're good things. But I have this that I always pack with me as well. And I don't know if you can see what it is. And down there, it looks just like a rope, but it's a Rietta. And a Rietta is braided rawhide. And this is a real nice little rope. I've roped with this bugger for a long time at a lot of Brandon's and I just, it's just a neat little rope. And it is probably one of the oldest tools known to mankind for handling livestock. This is four strands of rawhide and it's been around since before biblical times or whenever. When they started killing animals and using their hide, this started. And they first started tethering animals out. You wanna talk about grazing management, this is your first electric fence, your first barbed wire fence. They tethered animals up and they tied them out to graze. As it evolved, this become a rope for capturing animals or for, for uh, catching horses or whatever. So I, I declare this as stockmanship. This rope is the symbol of stockmanship. And of course, ropes have developed a lot more since this technology too. Now we've got nylon ropes. If you go to the calf roping or the, I don't know if you call it a calf roping here or a tie down rope in the match, you'll see some pretty sophisticated ropes. If, if we don't use this technology, the ring scale, our computers, all the things we can learn online, if we're not using that, we're missing a big part. But if we miss, if we miss this segment, the stockmanship segment of the deal, it's really, really tough to get things done right. Now, as we get more and more involved with machines, tractors, cars, and less and less involved with handling animals on a daily basis, we lose some of the natural skills that uh, you just grow up with and you drive a team all the time or milk a cow or feed the chickens. Those were, those were things that were just natural to people when everything they did was with animals. But now we work with animals a very small percentage of the time. And we get 
to where we don't work them quite the same as maybe we did before. And so what we've done is we've come up with better facilities and that's good. Facilities are part of the technology, but just because you have good facilities doesn't mean the cattle are gonna work right and, and get things done the way we need to do them. So it comes back to the skill of stockmanship. And uh, I think it's real important to think about that. Now, what has happened? First, we're gonna talk about, I always like to tackle the hardest things first. So we might as well talk about human behavior first, and then we'll go into animal behavior. All of us here have learned how to survive in our human environment. And the busier the world gets, the more we gotta to learn to work in a way that's human friendly. And the main thing we have to do to live in this fast paced world we live in, where we get in lines to eat, we get in on roads to drive, we learn to line up and get right in behind somebody. And you follow them up in line or going to the movie or paying your, uh, your getting your car license or whatever. You walk around behind somebody and you get in line and you follow them up. When we're out on the highway, we get in behind people and we follow them up or they get right behind us. We even build roads so you can do that. Now, I am so messed up. When we go, we, we, we pulled out of the motel this morning and there at Joplin, there's a thing where you go on the opposite side there and everybody else is coming the other way. Ryan and I were both confused. You see, they, nest, they, they changed that deal and now we don't follow people up anymore. And I, I didn't like that because it, I wasn't used to it. It wasn't my habit. Roundabouts, those look like the craziest dang thing in the world because we're not, not used to going straight in the line behind somebody. People get real confused. So our human world tells us to get right in behind somebody and follow them up. And that's what we have learned to live and that's what we do. Now, I don't think great grandma and grandpa did that. And especially before that, before there was a lot of roads and a lot of lines where you lined up. So I think a lot of our livestock handling problems might be from our habits of going around behind somebody and following up. When we go to work at our livestock, we do the exact same thing. What took me, used to take me 30 days, now would take, I could do a lot more in two hours. And the main reason was, is before, uh, back when I was a kid and my grandfather was helping me, I didn't have a round pen. And I drove a lot of horses and I got in behind them just like driving a car and I drove them and I'd have to work quite a bit before I could get them get on or safe enough to ride and go. But if you get a round pen, it changes the whole dynamic dynamics of working a colt. And the reason that happens is because I used to think the round pen was because you, your horse could walk, trot and lope in a circle both ways, kind of natural, but not get away from you. But really what it does is it gets you working the horse on his side. You start out on the horse's side, work up and down his side, and you can get control of the horse's mind and his body first. So just by a simple change of your position, it changes the whole dynamics of the way that the relationship was with the horse. And I learned a lot of other things too, like pressure and release and all those things, which really increase the speed of getting things done. The good part about it was, is I think the horses that I started after, especially after I'd done it for a while, when I first started out, I didn't think anything could buck me off. And uh, I kind of set out to prove that. So it didn't matter if they're ready to get on or not. I just kind of pulled my hat down and I could ride them and I'd just go. But, but as I went on, I decided I couldn't ride them all. And I started using my, my presence, the pressure, the release and all the things that made a big change. So if we look at the cattle business, The horse business is kind of a predecessor. I believe this cattle handling thing is kind of following the footsteps of the horse thing. And 30, 40 years ago, there was a man by the name of Ray Hunt that started traveling around the country and uh, started doing clinics and talking to people. And a lot of people at the coffee shop or at the stop stable or at the rodeo arena would poo poo him a little bit and say, that old man's crazy. And he's putting those people on those horses with no halters on their head. He's going to get somebody killed. And he probably did get a few people close to being killed because they shouldn't have been riding colts in the first place. But if you were handy enough to understand what he was saying, you could really change the way you worked with the horse and really, really improve yourself. Well, 
the horse, the cattle business is kind of the same way. We, for a while, when I first started trying to do these things, people were just, they were, so I, I went to one, I went to a place in Nebraska and uh, Preford had a big old setup of equipment up there. And I went to work in these cattle. This guy got mad. I said, nope, put your hot shot away. We're going to vaccinate some calves. He, I said, put, it made him mad that I told him put his hot shot away. And uh, ended up his kid broke his hand. It was just, it was a lot of resistance. And in Nebraska, I guess they just don't understand some of those things. But in Missouri, they do, it seems. It's changed a lot in the last 15 years. Now people are starting to think, well, maybe there is something to this. The thing is, whatever you do has to match your skill level. And if you're going to tell a guy that's been working cattle for 30 years that he's been doing something wrong all this time and tell him not to do that anymore, that's ridiculous because he's survived it and he's got it done and he's been doing it. All I want to do tonight is give you some ideas that might help enhance whatever your skill level is or your style. Now there's people here with lace up boots and seed caps. And there's cowboy, there's people here with cowboy hats and custom made boots and everything in between. And what I see around the country is every segment of our industry has some success. We just use different styles. And I would say every style has some people that are really good and they get their animals worked really effectively. And there are some people that are just really bad. On the cowboy side, if you're good, you're really good. If you're bad, you better have good fences because the cowboy is about putting a lot of pressure on and getting her done. And, and the problem with being a cowboy is you want somebody and he's got a nice hat and a good pair of spurs and chaps and he looks cool. So you want to be like him. So you get the kit before you get the skill. And those are the worst kind. You should have to earn your, your, your hat. You should have to earn your spurs before you can even act like a cowboy. But that's another story here. So I, I am all for all different ways of working an animal that works. So I don't know what you do. The only thing I can do is tell you what might enhance what you're doing. One of the things that I've always appreciated about Kurt is he's not afraid to just say it how it should be said. <laughs> and uh, But when you think about what, when handling livestock, you know, that's the reality that we, we exist within, within our livestock. We, we just, we need that open honesty. And sometimes on our own operations, we have to figure out ways to better um, analyze what, how we have handled our cattle or how we've engaged in some of these uh, topics that Kurt's talking about. Kurt challenges people to go ahead and put a camera up. When the next time you and your family or you and your hired help get together to work your cattle, put a camera up because your viewpoint or what you're fixated on, or if you've also been thinking about the vaccines that are getting warm and the cooler, or if the food's getting close to ready or the help that showed up late. Sometimes like Nicole was saying, your paradigm or what, what you view the world as is actually different than how your actions are influencing those around you. And some of the wrecks that, uh, you know, maybe a cow gets pushed through a fence or something like that, because you don't have those strong fence lines that Kurt's talking about. A lot of that can be avoided, but we have to be a little more aware a little earlier on. And, but we, we can't reflect on that with just our own point of view and perspective when we're considering how it went yesterday working the cows. So setting up a camera is a great way to kind of challenge that and to assess. And, you know, we just got to remember that we can do as many refined enhancements or developments within our own genetic or technology um, influenced operations. But if, if stockmanship and the enhancement of our own stockmanship on our operation doesn't go hand in hand, we're wasting our money. Uh, we're losing money in, in a lot of instances because we're now stressing out animals in a circumstance that they don't need to be stressed out after we've already invested a bunch of money into them to get a higher feed efficiency. Well, we just ruined that because the animals are too stressed to gain any benefit from the high quality feed that we're giving them anyway. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the principles that have been shared thus far, thus far by Kurt in an arena segment that actually has him behind some livestock. So here is Kurt in a sheep handling demonstration.
as I approach these sheep, now I, I haven't even approached these sheep. I don't know how wild or how gentle they are. I'm not going to have any preconceived notions. What I'm going to do though, is I'm going to figure out where they're, you could call it the flight zone or what I like to call is the pressure zone. And what I want to do, I want to get this pressure zone down. I want to decrease the pressure zone if the, if the sheep are wild to where I can work them in the corrals where they're not stressed and they can think their way out of my pressure. If they're real gentle and lethargic, I'm gonna increase that zone a little bit so I can get them to move through and flow. So I'm gonna, as I walk to the, but when I walk to these sheep, it's not like I'm gonna go catch them. I'm gonna, when I approach these sheep, they won't even know I'm coming. I'm gonna walk over here like this, and then I'm gonna come over here like this. Now you see, they're starting to turn and look at me, but I'm not coming at them, so I'm not a threat. They think I'm gonna go by. Now I'll walk over this way, and I'm gonna to go to the first aid sign. See, this is a way to approach an animal in a way. Now I can step right in here and I don't have to get behind them. I can just work up their side and I can keep them going straight up that fence. But I'll push on my leader. Now, as soon as they turn back, I gotta move my position. And now I want them to go straighter, so I'll step out wide and I'm just gonna push on their eyes. See, now they like to turn and look at me. As soon as they go, I'm gonna step across this way, back and forth this way. I'll widen out over here to keep this left side. I'm driving my team again, keep my left side going. Now I got to speed up my right side and I'll just kind of teach these sheep how to drive. So I'm not staying in behind them. I'm going back and forth, back and forth. Now, as they come across here, I'm going to hook these sheep on. And that means get them to turn and look at me. The biggest problem we have with sheep when we're trying to work them inside the corrals is getting them to come by me, getting them to come out and come by me. So I'm going to use this opportunity right here and I'll just walk up with these sheep and I'll just let them work their way down this fence line. Now, if I wanna go up their side, I should be able to slow them down. If I wanna turn and go back against them, I should speed them up. So I don't have to get over in front of these sheep. I can just simply step up their side and slow them down or stop them. Now, as I ask them to go, I'll just walk right into this lead and I'm gonna send, send these ewes right on up. I don't, I don't follow right with them because <laughs> then they won't ever they won't ever get a reward from going so i'll just step out step back in these these guys i just would like them to get where they'll flow a little easier and move away from me and not be afraid and have to turn around and look at me i gotta keep i gotta stay far enough forward where i keep them flowing now right here i'm gonna come across come right they're telling me what to do and i'll just i'm gonna i'm gonna back up and i'll stop them now they turn back on me i'm gonna change your mind i'm gonna step back change your mind they were, they were thinking about going to the trailer. If I just stopped automatically, they'd have split and went around me and run by me. But by stepping back just a little ways, I moved in front of their mind or their balance point. And now I should be able to turn them and get them to go back to their, to my uh, right, their left. And I'll just ask them to step across that way. And I'll just turn them and walk them across that direction. And I'll try to send them across to their left. And again, I have to back up change their mind, step back in and get them to turn, turn away from me. And I'll just, I'll rock back and forth here, back and forth, back and forth until they learn what I'm asking them. And I'll just ask them to turn and walk away from me. And then when they do that, I'll just let them have a little bit of time to think about it. Now I don't want them to turn and run towards the trailer. So I'll just step up, catch that leader's eye, stop her, hook them on and say, okay. Here's our time. Now this, what I'm doing, I'm applying three kinds of pressure here. I have a driving pressure. I have a drawing pressure, which is when I step back, that's drawing their minds to me. You can see they're looking at me. And now I, I'll keep a maintaining pressure. So right here, if I keep moving back and forth, I'll just keep moving back and forth a little bit. Now their mind stays on me. As soon as I get still and quit, now you'll see them start looking other places. So I've lost, I've lost their, their uh, attention. Now that's all right, because they're gonna go up towards the, where I want them to go anyway. So sometimes that's all right. Now as soon, but the problem is now watch what happens here. As soon as I get their attention again, they're all gonna turn back and look at me. When I come across here, it's gonna get them. See, now they gotta turn back and look at me. So I wanna teach these sheep that they can turn away, turn away and I'll, I won't go directly at them. I'll just walk, I'll just, I'll just work back and forth here, back and forth. 
get that movement started. And now I'll step back and stop it. I'm gonna ask them to go across to this side. So I'll hook them on, draw them, get their minds looking to their right, my left, and I'll just ask them to step across and walk towards the fence that way. So now I'm getting a little bit of direction with my sheep and I gotta position myself. They're telling me where to get to get them to go that direction. Now I gotta widen out. They're gonna to wanna to come back down, good. Now I'll ask them to come back this way. I'll ask that leader to look at me. So I'll draw her mind to me. I'll draw, draw, I gotta get her mind there. Now I should be able to step right by and she should come right by me this way. So now I'm controlling their mind and their feet. And I'll just ask her to step right on forward. And I'll just keep working these sheep around here until I, I, I can tell them just to look at that hole right there. And I'll just keep these sheep a coming and I'll just let them work their way into that pen. And I'll just keep, keep enough pressure with these sheep on the back that they keep rolling on through. And I'll just roll these sheep into that pen. And I'll just keep rolling them around, rolling them around. I'm back and forth. This is just enough pressure to cause these guys not to panic by me. And I'll just roll these guys on around. Now, right there, I was, I was putting a little too much pressure on. I'll step back, send. There, now, now my sheep, and I'll just, I'll just keep rolling. See, if I, if I put too much pressure and I just gotta keep this, it's, I call this the domino effect. These sheep back here push the sheep in the front into the pen and I'll just keep working. If I put too much pressure back here, it's gonna send these back by me. As soon as they step over that threshold, we're in pretty good shape. See, now, now I want them just to, I'm gonna step back and let them come across this pen and fill up this pen in here and these sheep all ought to, follow their way in there. And I'll just work back and forth, back and forth, push her forward, step back, let this one in, pressure in, step her in, good. So those sheep, those sheep decided to go in that pen. I didn't force them in there. They decided to go in there on their own. And when a sheep does that, they learned all the way through here, we were, we were learning Here's what I was trying to teach them. If I put pressure on you, if you move away from that pressure, you'll take the pressure off yourself. And that's how an animal learns from pressure. They learn from pressure, but they retain, retain it from the release of pressure. So by them moving away from the pressure, they learn to think their way out of my pressure. That's real, real important. Now those sheep went in there and their heart rate is low. They're not scared, they're, they're searching, they're figuring out ways. And I think that's, that's a real, real good way to put sheep somewhere. What I wanna do is I wanna really show you how I, I think it's real important the way you turn sheep out of, a, out of a corral. So it's important how I walk up here. When I walk up, again, I'm walking this way and then I'm walking back this way. I'm not just walking directly at these sheep because then, see, I can get, I'm getting these sheep where they're not afraid of me at all. Now, when I open this gate up, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let these sheep come on out. I'm gonna start them out. I'm gonna start them out of this corral. And as they come out, if they will, <coughs> I'll get me a leader started. As they start to come out, they don't like to step over these bars. Well, that's pretty nice. See, when you put sheep in where it's not a threat to them, that's a good way, that's, that's all right. But we want sheep to be able to come by us. There we go, perfect, just right. And you can just walk back and forth a couple of times and they ought to come right on out. Good. Now, when they come out, I want to, I want to be, I want to be up here in control of them. So when I turn sheep out or cattle out or whatever, especially if I'm in a grazing situation, if I was going to change pastures here with these sheep and I had an intensive grazing program, I would want to be right up here where I can control those sheep's mind and, and I can, I can walk them down the fence line and I can say, well, 
right at that old college arena sign, I want you sheep to stop and go to grazing. And as I get right about here, I'll stop them and I'll just leave them there. And that's what we call placing livestock. And if there was some grass or something right there, they'd put their head down and go to grazing. And that's called placing animals. And if they, if they decide to go there and there's not much movement in there, they'll just stay right there and graze their way through your paddock. So grazing becomes a much simpler thing. And sheep are so easy to get to keep together with, uh, with proper handling. They want to stay together. So grazing management becomes real easy. Okay, I'll ask them to just turn around and I'll start these guys. Now, I'm not gonna go behind them. I'll just roll this around here and I'll just start my movement in and I'll just head them back towards that gate. <coughs> and I'll just, I'm, I'm making a straight line here and I just keep working this line in and I'll just try to keep pointing these, cat, these sheep's eye towards that gate. All I'm doing is pointing my, my herd or the nose to the gate. Now, I would like to get them to go straight in, but if I have to roll them around the gate, that's all right. I don't mind rolling sheep around. So, so when you get sheep where they don't want to go into the pen, you can roll them, use your, use your herd, and roll the sheep right around it as if it's a gate, a fence. So that they understand how to go in that pen now. That's teaching sheep how to go into a pen. So one of the things that I think, you know, Kurt really emphasized in that video is when you're handling livestock, um, that's just what you're handling, an alive animal. And, you know, he said he'd never approached these sheep before. And in my couple of weeks of traveling around doing different demonstrations with him, he's not lying. We would show up 10, 15 minutes before um, the registration for the event would happen. We'd take in one or two presentations and then there he was, he would enter into a, an arena or a round corral with animals that had just been, the gate had been thrown open on the trailer and they were thrown out. So um, it's, it's really common for him to, at every one of his demonstrations, to be engaging with livestock that he's never once engaged with before. And it's, it's hard telling if the animals were even ever treated with this sort of thoughtful stockmanship prior to Kurt engaging with them. Um, and so these practices or these concepts that are being shared, you know, it's, it's so applicable to whatever group of stock you handle. And since interning with Kurt, you know, there's a lot of the stuff that I learned from him that we've been deploying on our own ranch here in South Dakota that, uh, you know, we're seeing over the course of two years, a significant change in how our cattle handle. Um, we have a, a pen of weaned calves off of our cows, and it's like they've been worked through a system on their own, their whole, you know, every week. And quite frankly, we've only had those calves in a corral two times in their life, uh, one for branding, one for fall shots, and then we weaned them. And, and so the fact that they're looking for the gate and they're, they're, coming up to us to see what it is that we're up to, that just goes to show that when you shift your operations management to have an emphasis on stockmanship, you're going to see uh, a tenfold impact, not just in your, um, your reproduction herd, but also in the offspring that you're raising. And I don't really even remember the last time that there was any hollering going on between the help at, in working our cattle. And that enhances the relationships with the people that we get to live this lifestyle and work with as well. So now we're gonna jump into a video where there's some you know, general tips and reminders. He talked a little specifically to sheep in the past video, but this tips for effective stockmanship talks about just in general ways that you can go about addressing and enhancing your stockmanship of your operation. And so what I wanna talk about today is some of the skills that we can use for herding sheep or any other kind of animal you wanna think about. The main thing you need to understand when you're working with sheep is they need to see you. That's really, really important. They need to see you. And if they can't see you, they're gonna to try to get to a spot where they can see you. Now, the problem with sheep is they have wool. Cattle don't have wool, and so they can see behind them easier. But when you get in behind a sheep, 
they've got to turn their head to see you and that changes their direction a lot of times. So our position is probably more important on sheep than any other animals we work with. The problem with, with uh, most humans want to go around behind animals and drive them. And we have to get behind animals and drive them, but if we drive them in a way that keeps them looking at us and turning their heads towards us, we're always going to be fixing the direction of our sheep. So if you think about a team, I, I was just out back here and there's a whole bunch of uh, carts and stuff for driving teams behind. So if you've ever had a team, driven a team, or you've seen a team of horses driven, there's one thing that every harness usually has on it. Anybody got an idea what that is? Blinders. Most bridles have blinders on them when you're driving a team. And the reason they have blinders is because is it keeps the horses going straight. When you're driving a team, your horses need to be, they need to pull straight and even. If they don't pull straight and even, if you've got a team, then you don't have a team, you have a single horse pulling at different times. But if they pull straight and even, you've got a team. And the reason you have blinders is if you didn't have blinders, they'd always be turning and looking and they wouldn't be going straight. They'd be doing this all the time. So I kind of look at sheep. If we're going to, if you think about that, we can't put blinders on the sheep, even though they kind of have them with their wool. We've got to position ourselves where we, because they're not tied together, where we keep these sheep where they're going and, and being consistent. When we're driving sheep, think if, if your sheep, one of the things when you, when you handle lots of young, like these ewe lambs, they'll get the circling on you. They just get the whirling or circling if you got a lot of numbers, 100 or more. They get to circling. And what you want to do, you don't want the, what's happening when sheep start shirt circling, the right side, if they're circling this way, that means the right side is going faster than the left side. So speed the left side up. If you want to make your sheep turn, if you're driving sheep out there and you want them to turn, speed the left side of your sheep up, step in and speed this side up and slow this side down over here. And that makes a nice turn. If you want them to go straight, go back and forth like a border collie dog would and keep them going straight, keep both sides even. So driving sheep gets to be real, real easy if you watch your sheep and they'll tell you what to do. All you're doing is speeding up one side or slowing it down to make a turn or keep them going straight. It's that simple. But watch what your position is doing. Now people drive sheep crazy when they get right in behind them and drive them. Because they go here and the sheep are going here and then they all start that way. Then they run over here and then the sheep all go that way. So you've got to watch your lead and keep moving back and forth and keep your lead pointed and keep the other sheep pushing them. Everybody all right with that? Now, I know a lot of you are gonna call sheep, call sheep to you with grain or feed. That's okay. That's no problem. That's a drawing pressure. The problem is, is when you get them up inside the pen, sometimes you can't draw them anymore. They won't come up the shooter onto the truck. And so if you get in that situation, those sheep have to drive. And I just as soon teach my sheep to drive out here so that when I get them in the corrals, I can be in their pressure zone or flight zone and drive them where they don't go crazy and get their heart rate up and, and start not thinking, but panicking in those shoots. When, when sheep start panicking, what do they do? They lay down or they go hide in the bunch. Cattle, when they panic, they'll kick you, run over you or jump the fence. But sheep, they just go hide in a, in a, they huddle up in the bunch because they have no protection except getting in the bunch. So when you get sheep stressed, that's when you start grabbing sheep and trying to drag them up through. So that's really important to remember. What if there's feet on the ground or what if there's a sack hanging on the fence or something that was deterring them? That means you've got to put more pressure on. See, if there's grass here, I've got to become more pressure than the grass. An animal can only think of one thing at a time. If, 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 if he's thinking about me, he's going to walk right past the grass. But this is the trouble. I don't call this low stress livestock handling. I call it effective stockmanship. Because if you're doing low stress livestock handling, you're pretty likely those sheep are going to stop there and graze because you're being real low stress. But to me, that's not effective. You've got to be putting enough pressure on because you're going to end up putting more stress on those animals if they stop to graze to try to get them to move again. So if I can keep them going and I see that coming and I move into that pressure and they never even see the grass, then, then I, but it's, you know, if it's clover that deep, it's pretty hard to do that. And so you've got to sometimes, I was, I came in here this morning and watched some kids, a bunch of kids riding and they had tarps and they had 
stuff hanging all they were dragging sleds and all kinds of stuff and those horses were really taking it well but they trained those they didn't just start that this morning they trained those horses to respond and go over bridges and and they were going over jumps and over tarps and things like that i see horse people do that all the time but we never teach our sheep to drive before we try to drive them and i think that's the big thing and this is the pleasure i get out of having sheep or cattle or pigs or whatever is the pleasure i get is teaching those animals to drive, teach them to work for me. So, so those are challenges. And, and if, if they stop, then it means to me, that means I didn't put my pressure on in the right place or I was late with my pressure. That help? But always remember an animal can only think of one thing at a time. Now, if you don't have grass, if you don't have distractions as Temple Grandin would call it, that makes it so much easier. But like, uh, like some people say, well, my sheep load good in the morning, but not the afternoon because the sun is in the way. Now you can mo move a jacket off the, off the fence or you can take your coat off the, uh, a chain off the fence, but it's pretty hard to move the sun. So you either got to figure out when to work your sheep or teach them that when they take the right pressure, they don't even think about the distractions. So hopefully that's helpful. So a few takeaways that I have jotted down here, uh, you know, animal shape, size, and even their disposition, if they've been um, selectively bred or, or kept back in the herd specifically for a quality um, disposition, those are all going to influence how, how you position yourselves within those cattle. You know, if you're dealing with sheep that have just been uh, freshly sheared, they don't have that big wool, you know, blinder that he referred to. And when you get done handling your sheep for the day, you're probably going to go about uh, handling your cattle a little differently that afternoon. And so we just have to consider, um, even from one operation to the next, if we're, if we're helping a neighbor, um, you know, every group of cattle has their own uh, pressure zone that he referred to. And, and some, of, some groups of livestock have been more exposed to that drawing pressure. Some of them um, have they rely heavily on that driving pressure. And uh, some of them, all they really need is that maintaining pressure. They just need us to position ourselves in a way for the livestock to be able to do their thinking so they can think their way through that system. And it's important to remember that, you know, we really have to train ourselves to be students of quality stockmanship. We have to consider that human inclination and the institutionalized reality of, you know, how we stand in line at the grocery store or we sit in rows in conferences, not this one this year, I guess, but those are things that have been ingrained in us by society as the norm, but that's not how nature is. That's not how animals function. And so we have to go against that human inclination sometimes and, and think a little more like that stock animal and try to interpret how they view us so that we can better interact with them. And then we have to remember that, you know, this practice of stockmanship starts, uh, it, do, it doesn't start and stop throughout the year. It should be every single encounter within that animal's entirety of their life within your operation. So from calving season to the ways that you interact with them as newborn calves, all the way up until when you're dropping them off at the processing facility, you know, the, the more we can focus on stockmanship and teaching our livestock to think their way through things and to know how to navigate and what to prepare for, the better off they're going to be when we enter them into that next phase of whatever development is. You know, how many of us work with our cattle, helping them find the gate before we send them to the sale barn? We don't typically do that very often in the industry. And I would, I would argue that and I, there's probably statistics and data out there that show if your cattle are used to working through crowded spaces and finding the gate and being sorted, they're going to have a lower level of shrink on them when they get to the sale barn. And, and you don't have to worry so much about the, the overwhelming stress of that change in environment impacting their weight as they go across the scale to be sold. So every engagement that you participate in with your livestock throughout the year is, is important. And, you know, referring back to that original quote that uh, Kurt had said, it can, it can change your quality of life. And that is very helpful. We've got one more demonstration here. It's a much shorter video. We're right at about a six minute video. And I'll go ahead and kick that one off. Take my pressure. 
you can go forward. They get real comfortable about that. And then they, the, here's the, here, I, I've always kind of, there's a line. What is low stress? What is high stress? There's a line in the sand here. And this is for humans, kids, animals. When an animal or a human decides to do something on their own, it's low stress. Now, how well they decide is how far away from the line they get. If an animal is forced to do something, then it's high stress. Low stress when they decide to do something, high stress when, they, when they're forced to do it. And this is where we talk facilities. You know, just like the, the, the V's, the tubs. The tub, it allows you to force animals with lower pressure. They make up their mind to go quicker. The old V, they had to be forced. And I, I've been thinking about this, the, the driving aid, the buggy whip came about, about the time the V's were coming in. Because you had to use quite a little bit of pressure, the old buggy whip, where you had to pop them on the hocks. You had to use quite a bit of pressure to get them to go up through there. And then, then as we progressed, we went to the tub, then we went to the sword sticks and the paddles and, and uh, flags. And now what we're trying to talk about, and, and hot shots. And now what we're trying to talk about is figure out a facility that's even better than those. Even less pressure than those, so you don't have to use any driving aids. Because when I'm working dogs, I like to work dogs, horses. I, I've quit using spurs on my horses. And, and this is no different than a driving aid. And I know, geez, in Texas, that's almost like saying, take off your cowboy hat. The reason I quit, you, I, I still have spurs. And when I come to Texas, I got some real nice ones that I can go to the barbecues and stuff with. That's kind of a little bad joke, but anyway, <laughs> somebody to get it. I have spurs in my barn. And if I have a horse that's real pushy, real dead sided, real snotty, that just lays into my leg, I go put them on. And it, when my kids were small, when we were riding colts, when I went and put my spurs on, they headed out because they knew there was going to be some hair flying. And I could turn my toe out and stick it in one. And as soon as I got his mind changed and moving away from that spur, I took it back off again. And what I found when I took my spurs off, it's not that I think spurs are bad. It was allowing me to force the animal to do things that he didn't want it to do. I didn't have the animal positioned right to do what I wanted him to do with his body so he couldn't do it beautiful, nice, and he didn't flow. But if you have a big old riled spur, and even though his feet are in the wrong position, you can stick it out and stick it in him, and he'll still make that move. But it's not right. It's not as beautiful as we could have it. And so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with spurs. It's just how you use them. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a hot shot or a sort stick or a rattle paddle or a cane or whatever. It's just how do you use it and what kind of discipline do you use it with? And when animals get really stressed and really bothered, is when we put pressure on them where they have nowhere to go. When you use this hot shot or even the air and there's a bunch of cattle and there's nowhere to go, they get to jumping on each other. When cattle get to jumping on each other or bumping into each other with nowhere to go, a panic sets through them. And then they don't work. They don't think, their brain switches. And there's, there's three things that a, an animal needs. He has a growth phase. This is how his brain works. He has the growth phase. That's where he's thinking. He's looking and seeing which, which bite of grass to get. He's looking and thinking which, which alley to go up where he's going to get the less pressure. Should I go up that chute? That's when he's in the thinking mode. When his brain switches and he gets too much pressure, he goes into the reaction mode. And that's when horses, that's why we have these big old tall things here. That When they go in the reaction mode, they're trying to climb out of the ring. They're running people up the fence. The horse is running away and trying to buck. That's the reaction mode. And if we get in that mode, they don't learn and they don't think, and it's real hard. Then you have to force the animal to do things. And if it's, if it's bad enough, what happens is, is adrenaline kicks into the bloodstream. And when that happens, that's when the immune system shuts down. That's when stress is really bad. When adrenaline and cortisone kicks into the bloodstream, it tells the immune system to shut down. And the reason it does that is because there's no use fighting off the influenza or, or foot rot or whatever. 
If there's a mountain lion chasing, you're going to eat you. There's no use fighting that off. Just get out of there. So they shut all the, the things that take a lot of energy down so you can get away. And when that happens, that's when cat animals quit working for you. So we want to keep them in that thinking mode. The other mode that I think is real important with some of the stuff that Ron and Todd were talking about with these with health gains and, and less incidences of death and weight loss and all those things, the real important thing that animals have to do is show their enthusiasm. They got to have fun. They got to run and buck and play. And this is what happens, I think, sometimes in our feed yards. These cattle get depressed. They don't have any fun. And there's people that are promoting taking cattle out and run them up and down the Dover's Alley. Let them run and buck. Take them out in the pasture and let them go around and move out and run and buck and play and fart just a little bit. Then bring them in and their conversion rates go way up. Things happen. I see it the same thing in the horse business. There's horses that are stalled all the time and, and have a real tough time having much fun and they just don't perform. So I think we need to figure that out. How to get these cattle where they can feel good show their real emotions and run and buck and play a little bit. But as far as getting the animals to think and work for us, they got to stay on the low stress side. Now you, if you'll, All right. Now, one of the things that I've noticed every time I get a chance to visit with Kurt is, you know, his resounding message is we have to focus on a future in our industry that is bright. You know, it pays tribute to the past, but it also learns from it and it creates a present world that embraces a high quality of life, keeping us and our family stewarding great stock on our beloved land. These videos and so many more of, um, you know, Kurt, he, he takes a lot of time writing out his thoughts as he travels about the country, learning with people and, and teaching others. You can learn more about his stuff and you can even subscribe to his Scoop Loop blog <laughs> at uh, kurtpatesstockmanship.com. So if you have any questions, um, thank you for joining us. I encourage you to reach out to Kurt uh, on his webpage and um, we look forward to hosting him again in the future, uh, maybe when we're back to doing some live demonstrations across the country. So thank you for joining us and Kat, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you for participating today with the economic benefit of livestock handling with Kurt Pate and Kelsey Dushnow. We also give out a big thank you to all the sponsors of the IAC conference. This session was sponsored by our champions of native agriculture.